All right, today we're going to talk about algebraic expressions. So we're going to write algebraic expressions. And we're also going to talk about slash. We're going to talk about properties of numbers. We've already talked a little bit about properties of numbers, but we're going to talk a little more about it, okay? So the first thing we need to talk about, and this is going to be a, sort of the first thing under your list, is substitution. Substitution. All right, so let's say we have a problem like 2y, and let's add it to, let's do plus x. So we have 2y plus x. And let's say we know for some reason that x equals 3. And we know that y equals 5. The way we would solve this problem is we would substitute. We would take out the y, so we leave the 2 the same. But we take out the y, and in place of the y, we put in whatever y equals. In this case, we know that y equals 5, so we put 5 in here. And we also know that we're going to add it to x. And we know that x is 3, so we're going to substitute in 3 for x. So we have 2 times 5, which equals 10. And we add that to 3 plus 3. And for our final answer, we get 13. And that is how you substitute things. So copy that down, and I'll do one more example. Let's say you have a problem like negative, negative x. All this means is that we're going to do, we're going to take a negative, negative, we're going to do a negative, negative x. So, but here's the problem. Let's say, for instance, that x equals negative 7. Well, this x right here doesn't take into account this negative right here. So we have to add in, an, so when we substitute for this problem, we have to add in another negative. So not only do we have the first two negatives, but we also have to add in another negative 7. Okay? And you can think of each of these negatives as a multiplication problem of negative 1. So let's make it into, each of these negatives represents negative 1. So we'll write negative 1 times negative 7. And then we're going to multiply it by negative 1 in the end. So negative 1 times negative 7, we have a negative and a negative. And any times you multiply two negatives together, you get a positive. And we're going to multiply that by negative 1. And, but a negative times a positive is a negative. So our final answer is negative 7. So whenever you have a thing with a bunch of negatives like this, and, there's a, and, the, and the x itself is negative, you have to add in that other negative to make sure that you do the problem correctly. Let's look at another example. Let's say that x equals negative 6, and we have a negative, and we want to find the negative of negative x again. Whoops, you don't need that. You don't need that other thing right there. Let's just make it x. Okay? So again, we have a negative 6, so we have to put that in first. So let's put that in first. We have a negative 6. But then we have to add in this negative, and we also have to add in this negative right here. So we have a negative times a negative, and we know that it means negative 1 times negative 1. A negative times a negative is a positive, so that's positive 6. And then we have negative 1. And it's going to equal negative 6 because a negative times a positive is a negative. I think that's the three examples, so let's look at an example number four. Let's say, for instance, that you have the absolute value of x plus two times the absolute value of y. Those little brackets mean the absolute value. And let's say we know that y equals, let's say, negative 10, and we know that x is going to equal 15. In this case, we put 15 in for x. Oh, excuse me. We put 15 in for x, and we're going to add it 
to 2 times the absolute value of 10. Remember, the absolute value is the distance from 0. And so a distance cannot be negative. So this stays positive, 15 plus 2 times the absolute value of 10. Now the absolute value of 10 means the distance from 0. So to get to 0 from negative 10, you have to go 10 spaces, and it has to be positive. So we're going to make that positive. So 2 times 10 is 20. So there's 20. So we have 15 plus 20. And the answer is going to be 35. And that is how you do the absolute value problems. So copy that one down, and then we'll go on to example number 5. Example 5. Let's say, for instance, that you have the absolute value of x minus 2 times the absolute value of y. And let's say we know that x is, let's say x is negative 16. And let's say for some reason we know that y equals negative 4. So we put negative 16 in for x, negative 16 in for x, and we're going to leave the 2 the same, and we're going to put in negative 4 for y, because we know that y equals negative 4. So negative 4. So the absolute value of 16 is just 16, because the distance from 16 to 0 is 0. I mean, it's 16. And we're going to subtract that from 2 times the absolute value of 4. And we know that the distance from negative 4 to 0 is 4, so it's going to be positive because you can never have a negative absolute value. 2 times 4 is 8. And we know the other one just stays 16. So we have 16 minus 8. And 16 minus 8 equals 8. And that is how you solve absolute value problems. The other thing that you need to know, and this is going to be example number 6. Example 6 you need to know something about what's called the communicative prop, uh, property. Sorry, communicative. We're not, no, I mean communicative. Sorry, not com communicative is a disease. Communicative, on the other hand, we know that A plus B equals B plus A. If we put numbers in for it, it would be, let's say A was 3 and B was 5. We know that 3 plus 5 is the same as 5 plus 3. All we're doing is switching the numbers around. They both still equal 8. Okay. So in order, and the same thing goes true for um, equivalencies. So let's say we had um, 3 minus 4. This would be the same as 3 plus negative 4. All I did was I made it a positive problem and made the number negative. You could do the same thing for an addition problem. You could say, let's say we had um, 5 plus 3. You could make it into 5 minus negative 3, and they both equal 8. All we're doing is we're, we're changing it around, okay? So we're, these things are still equivalent. We're just changing them around. So for instance, let's say we had a problem like example number 7. Let's say you had 5x plus 3, and you wanted to make an equivalent equation. You could also do 5x minus negative 3 because minus a negative is the same thing as plus 3 or if it was let's say we had 6x minus 4 you could do the same problem as 6x plus negative 4 you see all we did was we made we made it into an addition problem but we made it a negative and these are how you solve these kinds of problems so for instance if you had a problem like example number 8 here Let's say you had a problem like negative 5x minus 3y. The front number always stays the same. Even though it's negative, it stays the same. So negative 5x. And we're going to, instead of taking away, we're going to add negative 3y. These problems are all exactly the same. This is the same as this. This is the same as this. And you need to know that before we can really do a lot in Algebra 2. One more example. Let's say you have a problem like 5 plus 3 plus 2. If you do 3 plus 2, it's going to be 5. Because you always do the parentheses first. 5 plus 5 is 10. Let's say, however, we had the problem 5 plus 3. We put that in parentheses and made it plus 2. 
Well, 5 plus 3 is 8, and plus 2, it still equals 10. They come out to be the same. So when you're doing addition problems, like let's say you had a plus b plus c, you could also change the parentheses and do a plus b plus c. You can change the parentheses, and the problem stays the same. You can change the parentheses. The problem still stays the same. Okay. So for instance, if we had a problem like, let's look at another example, we'll call this example 9. Let's say you, you had a problem like 5x plus 2y plus z. You could rewrite the problem as 5x plus 2y and put the parentheses around those two and add z. It doesn't change the problem. The other thing you can do to make fractions equivalent has to do with multiplication. So let's look at example 10. Okay, let's say you have x over 3y. Okay, now we could multiply this by 1. Let's say we were going to multiply it by, by, by 1. 1 is the same thing as 1 over 1. x times 1 is still just x, and 3y times 1 is still 3y. So we have the same thing. But you can also do the problem, let's say you have x over 3y, you could also multiply it by, let's say, 3. 3 over 3. And no matter what, as long as the number is the same on the top and the bottom, this will stay equivalent. It will stay the same. For instance, 3 times x is 3x, and 3 times y is 9y. Okay? And the reason you know it's still the same is because you can divide both sides by 3, divide both sides by 3, and you can get it down so that 3 divided by 3 is 1, so it's just 1x over 3y. And you can see that when you divide it, it goes back to the exact same original problem. You could also do it with another number, like let's say we wanted to do it with 5. Okay? You would have 5x, because x, 5 times x is 5, 3y times 5 is 15y, but still, you can divide both sides by 5, divide both sides by 5, and it comes out to be x over 3y still. So you could, you could multiply any number as long as the fraction is the same on the top and the bottom by any number. And this fraction, like this fraction right here, or this problem right here, it will stay the same. So if you have a problem that you can't solve and you want to multiply it by a fraction, it's always good to multiply it by a fraction of 1 if it helps you solve the problem. It'll, and you'll see later on how it'll help you. So for instance, let's look at example 11. Let's say you have a problem like 3x over 5, and they ask you to find an equivalent fraction by using the fraction 3 over 3. 3 times 3 is 9, and you just leave the x the way it is, and 5 times 3 is 15, and that would be your answer. You can also simplify fractions if they have complex variables. For instance, this will be example, what number, what example are we on now? Example 12. Let's say, for instance, you have 6xy over 2x. Well, the first thing you notice here is that you have a 6 and a 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so we know that's 3. The next thing we see here is we have x and x. Anything divided by itself, like for instance 5 divided by 5 or 4 divided by 4 is 1. So in the same way, x divided by x, since it's the same number, is going to be 1. And then we also have the y left over. Now we know 3 times 1 is 3, so the final answer is just going to be 3y. And we've simplified the problem from this complicated thing to this simple thing. And so when you're doing that, you want to try to, as much as possible, reduce fractions when you can because it makes the problem simpler. For example, let's look at example 13. Let's say, for instance, you have 10yz over 5z. The first thing you can look at here is 10 divided by 5. So 10 divided by 5 equals 2. And z divided by z is 1. So we're multiplying it by 1. And then the y is just by itself, so it stays the same. 2 times 1 is 2, and y. And so we've simplified this complex fraction into something much simpler. 
So now what I want you to do is go to page in your, in your book, go to page 18, and do numbers. one through 28, and that'll be your work for today.